lessons that uh, we can take for dealing with North Korea in the threat there posed? Well, with North Korea, um, the, the, the issue of whether, specific, I, I think you're asking the question in particular from the Iran experience, yes. what it might carry over. I think some things carry over and some things don't. Uh, and um, uh, there's a, you know, obviously a major differentiator is Iran does not now have nuclear weapons, hopefully, well, and progress are never will, and that's what they say as well. Whereas North Korea is the opposite uh, in terms of demonstrably having them and uh, declaring them as essential to their, uh, to their uh, path forward. Uh, so I would say one thing that does carry over is that, as I already mentioned, when all is said and done, the most important part of the of JCPOA is the set of extraordinary verification and transparency measures that go beyond what is the norm, might by quite a lot, and having emphasized very early on that if that's not on the table, extraordinary verification measures, there's no point talking. Because like it or not, claim misunderstanding or not, the reality is the international community did not have the trust for obvious reasons in the program. So there was going to happen. Now you go to North Korea, well, let's talk about that in spades, right? Uh, so I think actually it's going to be a very, very challenging issue, but there is no agreement without a strong, uh, uh, in, in, I would call it a JCPOA or JCPOA plus verification regime. That's one thing I would certainly think. On the other hand, and this is not just a personal view, uh, not to be ascribed to my API colleagues yet. See, I, I, I think that the President's decision at the very beginning of his term to narrow the negotiations specifically to the nuclear weapons issue and not try to encompass all the other problems we have in Iran was exactly the right decision. I've said the intelligence, I think it's completely analogous to Ron Reagan's negotiation of arms control with the Soviet Union when he had so many other problems, but just go after that kind of, you know, get that existential thing done and then see what happens. Uh, in years, I, I've always heard Iran, I, I'm hoping certainly that a decade of time scale will see. Uh, I think with Korea, it's the opposite. I think we have too much narrowed the discussion to nuclear weapons, uh, as opposed to looking at the entire security context for North Korea, South Korea, China, Japan, not to mention general American military presence in, in East Asia. So uh, I, I think we need to, on the one hand, broaden that discussion, but on the other hand, make no bones about it and put it on the table very early, you want to talk verification in a very, very serious way. There are other things we can give them, that's a long story. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mullis. Um, I was wondering what you would say are the, what you see as the greatest threats uh, for the Iran deal from our side, um, from the U.S. side, and given one of those threats is that uh, Congress can pass legislation that undermines the JCPOA. Um, what would you say is, uh, from all your experience with the Hill, um, what's some advice that you would pass on to us about how to engage with Congress on this issue and others? Well, uh, first of all, I think that uh, many who, who were opposed to the deal at the time, including the office, including by the person who He's always always showing up. Some of my German Senate followers is going to be Bob uh, But it's also Secretary Mattis, uh, et cetera. Uh, they have all said, look, we didn't support the deal. Although, actually, let me emphasize, I want to emphasize. In just about every case, now for almost two years, 
Those who say we don't support the deal never are actually criticizing the deal. What they're criticizing is what the deal is not. Like, we don't like the fact that you didn't also solve Hezbollah and missiles and human rights, etc. My answer to that is, okay, I don't agree with you, frankly. I, I don't. But you can make a case. The time to make that case was 2009. Not when you got surprised that you made a deal. <coughs> right? Uh, so that's a little bit of a side bit. Uh, but, uh, but I think the reality is uh, a, lot of, you know, a lot of them have made very compelling statements that now the issue is compliance. Uh, and the reason is that I think it's clearly sunk in that if the United States were to break the deal, we would have the worst of both of us. Because the only reason the, uh, the sanctions, the economic sanctions, were effective was the extraordinary global cooperation with those sanctions. And, uh, and, uh, and, and again, Brent Skogroff, I've used this quote many times, but Brent Skogroff at the time of the deal uh, uh, wrote in uh, an op ed, you know, if we walk away, we walk away alone. And if we walk away alone, then the sanctions are not going to be effective, and Iran will not have the constraints. I happen to think, in that, in that scenario, Iran would still choose to follow many parts of the deal. But the point is, it would be then to their discretion in a certain sense, and the sanctions would not work. So I think that's sunk in. So I, I think the real, the real risks are, are around, are not the deal per se, but around all the other issues, and if the regional issues get too far out of control or that nothing works anymore. Uh, that, that's my gut feeling. But it requires vigilance and constant constant work at it. It's again the same message. When the ink goes dry, the job isn't over. You just gotta keep going at all the time. One last question. <clears throat> I'm Jay Cotton, and maybe I'm watching this go. And Secretary, I salute you for your efforts in the uh, Iranian deal. I think it's clear it would not have happened without you. I'm not worthy. So. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, I'm using that as a platform. Yeah, I'm not so complimentary about the U.S. nuclear weapons programs that happened under your tenure. And I have two questions regarding the interoperable warhead, which is going to transform the American nuclear weapons stock up. But um, I have a memo of 2012 from the Navy indicating lack of support for the interoperable warhead. That's my first question, is basically, can you comment on that? And then my second part to the same interoperable issue is Los Alamos is now tuning up to produce plutonium pits, the W87 that you're familiar with. But it won't be exact replicas. It sounds like there'll be surety mechanisms built in. How can the reliability of future plutonium pits be guaranteed if they're going to change, perhaps radically, the design when they can't test them, or alternatively, it drives us back towards testing? Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to general comment, uh, college general comments in the more specific. Um, one is that with regard to testing, uh, in the last couple of years, you may have seen in the fall of 2015 and then in the fall of 2016, we had two events that were designed to point out two important things. One, the CTBT ratification fiasco of 1999 was based on the fact that the science-based stewardship program in a no-testing regime was not yet established. 2015, we tried to emphasize, hello, it's been a long time now, the tools are there, it is established, that reason is gone. 
second reason was that the international uh, seismic monitoring network was not in place. Well, hello, it's not quite in place, it's virtual. So I would argue that the uh, two reasons that were put forward uh, in 99 for not pursuing CTBT have been now overtaken by uh, technology events, uh, and we should be examining that now. I think there's no doubt that the CTBT is in our and everybody else's interest. So, so I think that's one thing in terms of the testing question. Okay? It does mean that the science-based program, as the stockpile shrinks, has to keep performing for older and older weapon systems. Uh, and, uh, and I think, by the way, I think the, the laboratories, in particular the laboratories, uh, have shown incredible innovation and ingenuity to manage that science-based stewardship program without testing for, uh, for 20, 25 years, whatever it is. Uh, and, uh, and the prospect of doing that for decades down into the future. That's the first point. Second point, uh, and we're not going to debate it tonight, but uh, I do not agree with the statement that the interoperable uh, warheads somehow are a fundamental change of, of capability. And frankly, you can get rid of the interoperable warheads very easily by just going to six rather than five different so, you know, it's, the, the idea is to is to is to shrink down the number of, uh, of different warheads substantially. Get rid. Uh, we were trying to accelerate it. We think we did accelerate a little bit at least. Get rid of the last megaton class weapons. Uh, we don't need them. Uh, they're not relevant to any national security doctrine, in my view. That's not a universal value, that's, that's in my view. Uh, but there's no doubt in this program of going to the three plus two system that the megaton thing goes away. The only question is whether it's 2025 or we can move earlier to more like 2020, 2021. Uh, so, um, so I, I would stay focused on what I believe like as the key issues. The, the three plus two was the smallest system that could go through with, you know, you gotta accept with the idea that we are still in a deterrent posture. And I think that, um, I, I don't know when we can get back on that pathway uh, while the situation in Russia remains so, Difficult. Uh, and still, the Russian, not just in numbers, but in the doctrine, and, uh, some of the things that are happening. Uh, but if we can get back onto the track of Russia, the other thing that I uh, want to emphasize, or I would emphasize, is that I think we're not probably very far away when we've got to get into multilateral negotiations. It's not enough then for Russia and the United States. We've got to get rid of everywhere. And I would just end by saying, by repeating a word I mentioned now several times in different contexts. And it's a word that is unfortunately in my view left out in the in discussing the very desirable landscape of learning nuclear weapons, because we're all safer uh, without them. But verifiable. And the verifiability of that has not been seriously engaged. So that's probably honestly, one of the things I've said at NTI, I really want us to start looking at what is a pathway, a real pathway, that, that addresses the practical problems of what it would take on that path to zero. And, I, and frankly, I care less in that context, I care, I care less about that context, whether it's 10 years or 50 years, that is the point. What are the steps that we will have to overcome by getting into a multilateral negotiation, for example, addressing verifiability to make this a credible political outcome uh, across the across the world?
Thank you.